Across America, human monsters prey on the objects of their darkest desires. 95% plus uh, of serial killers are sexually motivated. What can they tell us about the troubling fantasies that compel them to kill? It's like a place I don't want to go to. America's top detectives search for clues. The victim tells us how she was murdered. On the trail of the serial killer. On an evening that LAPD was uh, had a surveillance team on Bonin, that he picked up a young boy, took him into a parking lot, and uh, began to have sex with the young boy. And they could, the officers could hear sounds coming out of the van that disturbed them. And the police almost waited a little too long. I mean, this kid was in the throes of being strangled in the back of that van. Fibers from Bonin's van tied into a number of the killings. We didn't really need his cooperation uh, to convict him, but we needed his cooperation to try to determine who he killed versus who someone else killed. Hoping to avoid the death penalty, Bonin led police to a missing body and detailed 21 chilling murders on tape. One of the things that struck me is that he was sitting there telling you in, in graphic detail how he brutalized, uh, sexually abused, and murdered these young boys, like he was talking about yesterday's news. I mean, it was just incredible the lack of emotion that he showed while he was describing all these murders. Dave Lopez got an exclusive when the freeway killer granted him a prison interview. It was like someone threw cold water on my face, listening to a guy sitting there describing to you how he killed people and why he killed people. Uh, oh, the kid looked, he was an easy target. It was a game, that kind of stuff. Bonning claimed that he'd been sexually assaulted himself as a young boy while in juvenile detention. I asked him, I said, what happens if you don't get caught? And I remember he looked at me and said, I'd still be killing. He just, he couldn't stop. He said that about four or five times. I couldn't stop. Police arrested two accomplices, Vernon Butts and James Monroe. Oh, I, I looked at Vernon and I said, can you go through it? And he said, yeah. So I mean, he got him and he said, you know, I asked him, I believe, you know, can I go through and hold his hands? And he held his hands and uh, I strangled him until he was dead. James Monroe was given 15 years to life in prison. Before he could be brought to trial, Vernon Butts hanged himself in his cell. William Bonin was convicted of 14 murders and sentenced to die by lethal injection. He said he, he'd been in prison enough that he wasn't afraid of prison, but he was terrified of the death penalty. He told me that. He says, I don't want to die. On February the 23rd, 1996, after William Bonin's appeals were exhausted, the notorious freeway killer was finally executed. He never told me why he enjoyed killing. He just said he liked the sound of kids dying. Other than that, he could give no other reason. Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Situated just across the border from El Paso, Texas, it's the site of one of the most bizarre serial murder cases in modern history. Since 1993, nearly 200 young women Many of them factory workers have been murdered here. As more and more bodies were found, relatives painted crosses remembering the dead and marched on the streets demanding action. In 1995, local authorities attributed six of the murders to Abdul Sharif, a wealthy Egyptian inventor previously convicted of sex crimes. From inside prison, as he appealed his murder conviction, Sharif paid gang members to commit identical crimes to provide him with the perfect alibi. Ten gang members were arrested in 1996, but mysteriously, the killings continued. 
In March 1999, with help from the American FBI, the police arrested four more suspects. One of them was a 27-year-old bus driver called El Tolteca, a reference to an ancient Mexican Indian tribe. To sort all this out, a high-ranking Mexican official sought the advice of Fresno State criminology professor Candice Skripek, who had trained with the FBI profiling unit at Quantico, Virginia. When a person is killed, their body speaks volumes to us about the perpetrator or perpetrators. Scrapek traveled to Juarez to help state prosecutor Luis Inoos with his three-year-old investigation of El Tolteca, an attempt to determine how many of the murders might be his. What do we see here? We're seeing the victim. You can... Excuse, sorry? Do we know how she was killed? Uh, the modus operandi was the was strangulate. Joined by Officer Francisco Carmona, they re-examined numerous crime scenes. In different time was found four bodies in this place, in this field. Por lo general, in most cases, the breasts were exposed, although the blouse wasn't completely removed. The other clothing was usually found under the victim, but in most of the cases, we could not find the panties. He apparently keeps the panties. The nature of this crime is a sex crime, and that means to me that it will be repeated. This is something that these kinds of offenders, it seems that they cannot stop until we stop them. Strangulation was used to kill almost all of the victims. They were also punched, and in some cases they were stabbed in the breasts, the belly, or the neck. The victim tells us how she was murdered. He will treat other people in similar ways, not necessarily so violently, but he's, he's not going to be tolerant of, of other people. Uh, he probably beats his wife, for example. A convicted rapist, El Tolteca, had once beaten his wife so badly that she miscarried their child. We have uh, a sexual predator. Uh, it is likely that he has done this kind of thing before. A desert area next to the city became a primary dumping ground for some of the bodies. Uh, an 11-year-old girl was found here inside the pipe. He's not burying them in the ground, and certainly he could do that here. Uh, it seems as if he really does want us to find them. A key to understanding a suspect is to determine his territorial boundaries, the serial killer's so-called comfort zone. And that's really what, what a comfort zone is, an, an area within which we feel at ease and in control. Serial murderers are no different. Uh, in fact, they feel at ease and in control in certain environments and not in others. From the railroad tracks to the electric tower is the area where the bodies were found. After police put the area under camera surveillance, it apparently drove the killer outside his comfort zone and into a fateful blunder. On March 17, 1999, the killer took his next victim far out to the desert. Nervous and hurried, he dumped a badly beaten 14-year-old girl here shortly after midnight, not realizing she might survive. She stumbled miles for help and eventually identified her attacker, El Tolteca. The top of the mill offered a clear vantage point from which to view his dumping ground. I didn't see it until I got up here, but it's so clear I could not understand how you could keep killing girls and leaving their bodies with the houses so close by. Arrows indicate where other bodies had been found, all within the vicinity of El Tolteca's home and workplace. I can see how difficult it is to find a body out there. It's really the perfect place to leave bodies. In the end, Scrapek helped link El Tolteca to only seven of the nearly 200 murders. In the autumn of 1988, Sacramento detective John Cabrera paid a visit to 1426 F Street, 
never expecting to stumble into a serial killer's graveyard. Upon arrival here, uh, there was nothing unusual other than this nice Victorian residence with this heavily vegetated yard. Roses were blooming at the rear of this well-kept boarding house, and the proprietor, Dorothea Puente, greeted Detective Cabrera graciously. She was an elderly woman, gray hair, um, kind of a, a very nice uh, next-door neighbor type person. Dorothea was popular in her downtown neighborhood, but Cabrera knew some things about her that her neighbors didn't. One of her lodgers, Bert Montoya, had been reported missing by his social worker. The missing persons report mentioned suspicious mounds of earth in Mrs. Puente's back garden. Before questioning Mrs. Puente, Detective Cabrera checked into her background. She was on parole from prison for cashing stolen social security checks that she had taken from uh, victims back in 1982. She would put knockout drops in their drink and once they passed out, she would get their check and make off with it. When Cabrera paid Dorothea a visit, he found her disarmingly sweet. She was very polite and uh, she even reminded me a little of my mother. Cabrera asked for and received permission to dig in Mrs. Puente's rose garden and she even provided a shovel for the job. So I took the shovel and I started hitting on it and hitting on it and hitting on it and it wouldn't budge. So I climbed down in the hole and I grasped this tree lo lo looking item and I took both hands on it and I grabbed it and I started pulling on it, pulling on it, pulling on it. And then finally it broke free. And at that time I looked at it and it was a human bone and it was the end of the joint. And uh, I was just shocked. And I jumped out of a hole. While Dorothea expressed surprise at the discovery, Cabrera secured the property until a forensic team could take over the next morning. The next day, as investigators began digging amongst the roses, Dorothea asked innocently if she might go out and meet a relative for coffee. So at that time, there wasn't anything that would have kept us from allowing her to go and have some coffee. So she grabbed her little coat and her handbag. We walked down the stairs and I escorted her down the street here to this corner. Cabrera watched Mrs. Puente make her way to a hotel coffee shop. Within minutes, parts of a second body had turned up, but when Cabrera went looking for Dorothea Puente, she'd vanished. Like so many others, Detective Cabrera had been taken in by her demeanor. What I thought was a simple request for a cup of coffee and a visit with a local relative here at the hotel would turn into her window of escape. While the authorities issued an all-points bulletin, Mrs. Puente remained a fugitive and investigators unearthed still more of her secrets. If we looked at, shall we say, the largest and healthiest roses, uh, we had a body usually underneath that particular plant. Uh, after all, this is uh, pretty good for plant life and I'm afraid it does act as fertilizer. Inside the old house, they sniffed out more grim evidence. When we rolled the carpet back, we got a very, very strong odor. An odor that I had smelled on many other occasions. An odor of death. It became almost a haunted house sensation. As the body count mounted, a local TV station dubbed the suspect Deadly Dotty, and crowds of onlookers gathered at the house. Five days of digging uncovered seven bodies, the remains of some of Dorothea's former boarders, while others remained missing. The coroner determined that a lethal dose of drugs had killed each victim. All had the same drug found in their body and none of them used this drug as a prescription the only person that was prescribed the drug that was found in all the victims was Dorothea Puente as the last bodies were exhumed 
Deadly Dotty was recognised in Los Angeles from a broadcast of the APB. She was arrested and returned to Sacramento, protesting her innocence. Her reason for these bodies being in her yard was that they all died of natural diseases, and she gave them a proper place to be buried. During a trial, the prosecutor referred to the victims as shadow people, loners and alcoholics on the fringes of society. The majority of them really didn't have any contact with their family. Puente's motive? The social security checks that kept coming after the recipients had been eliminated. Puente admitted to nothing more sinister than cashing the checks. You know what I'm talking about. I have never killed anybody in my life. And who did kill somebody? Mr. McCauley? Tell me now. Tell me now. I don't know. Tell me now. I don't know. Two hundred and some pounds, yeah. We're gonna need some muscle in here. How can such a small woman, um, an elderly woman, have carried all those bodies? It's our belief that she got assistance from someone. The problem is, uh, we don't know who that person is to this day. Charged with nine murders in all, Dorothea Puente was found guilty of three. She's now serving three life sentences after exhausting all her appeals. Like the residents of Sacramento's F Street, Detective Cabrera has learned that serial killers don't always fit a typical profile. I would say that the one thing that has really changed is probably the perception of a little old lady that once lived across the street who was greatly appreciated by her neighbors. The FBI um, called her uh, America's most prolific female serial killer. And that's what I know her as today, and that's what I think this nation knows her as. Ted Bundy, executed. John Wayne Gacy, executed. Jeffrey Dahmer, beaten to death in a prison toilet. Fates these sadistic serial killers deserved, or a lost opportunity to find out what makes them tick. Not to even suggest that these people should ever be released, but certainly they should be studied. And I think that's one dilemma in our society, is rather than study, we choose to eliminate them from, uh, from the scene. But until more is understood about men and women who kill compulsively, what can be done to protect society now? Profiler Robert Resler says there are early warning signs to watch for. I think that you have to get at the child, six, seven, eight years of age, way before 12 years of age, way before they go into adolescence. We're not winning the battle against domestic violence. And because we're not winning, we are creating the serial killers of tomorrow in our homes today. I think a psychologist uh, on the staff of every school, every elementary school, every high school, uh, would, would go a long, long way in, in stopping the violence that, we, that we're experiencing in our society today. Teachers. People in the home, neighbors, can all identify these signs of impending violence. Uh, generally speaking, there's animal torture, there's destruction of property, there's chronic bedwetting. Yeah, the big three are animal abuse, fire starting, and bedwetting. The problem with profiles and predictions, says serial killer Joel Rifkin, is that they don't always fit. The only of the three that was a problem was the bedwetting but that was deemed a uh, surgical problem and not a psychological problem. So I don't fit into the, the normal box. I'm like the round peg in the square hole. Studies do indicate that most serial killers are white males, above average in intelligence, often clean cut and charming. On the surface, the typical boy next door. If you simply met someone in a pub or a bar or at a party, could I tell with my experience of who's a serial killer, who's a violent offender? No. Criminologists estimate that three dozen may be on the loose in America at any one time, responsible for several hundred victims each year. The odds of being killed by a serial killer are so remote, much more likely to be killed by lightning, by train crash or plane crash than, than by a serial killer. However, if you're targeted, you're a goner. They were a tree and I was a bolt of lightning. I mean, it there's hundreds of girls in New York and hundreds of trees in the woods. You know, why that tree, why that bolt of lightning? I don't know. 
they are monsters. They truly are. So until we can identify and treat them early on, these human monsters will continue to walk among us, looking for their next victim. There's only one therapy for them, and that's, well, either you incarcerate them forever or you give them 4,000 volts of electricity. Keeping them indefinitely, never allowing them to get back into society and studying them uh, and researching uh, their problems uh, is the answer to future prevention. We have compelling telly next, as one man gets sucked into the engine of a fighter jet, and another gets sucked into an elephant's bum. World's most amazing videos, next.